Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Today we will have a look at the netcode of Call of Duty World War 2. Now, while I always do my best to keep the netcode analysis as simple as possible, you will still need to have some basic knowledge about computer networking, tick rates, update rates, network models, super bullets, lag compensation, packet loss and a few other things like how I do my network delay tests. So to keep the netcode analysis videos as short as possible, I've put all this information into a separate netcode 101 video, which you should have watched at least once before you continue with this video here. The card overlay in the top right corner of this video as well as the link in the description down below will both take you directly to that video. Now first of all, what kind of network model does this game use? In the past there were Call of Duty games that used just the dedicated server network model, while others like Infinite Warfare used both the dedicated server network model and the client hosted or listen server network model, where one of the players is also the server. Here it is important to understand that the client hosted or listen server network model is very different from the peer to peer network model, which I explained in my Netcode 101 video. The only area where Call of Duty games use peer to peer is for its voice over IP implementation, but more on that a little bit later. So which network model does the game use then? I know someone who recently talked to one of the developers and he told me that Call of Duty World War 2 also uses both the dedicated server and client hosted network models. However, he could not tell me when the game uses which or how it decides which it should use. So I joined well over 100 matches during the PC beta and kept an eye on NetLimiter to see the connections that the game client established. And not a single time did I end up in a client hosted match. I always got connected to a game server hosted by either Vulture, which has data centers in these locations, or gameservers.com, which has a quite impressive list of data centers that should allow players to get low latency connections if Activision actually uses all of them to host their game servers. So while it is entirely possible that matchmaking can put you in a client hosted match under certain conditions, I always ended up on a dedicated server during the beta and that is a very good sign. But I will investigate this further after the final release of the game. Maybe private or custom matches use the client hosted network model, which will most likely also mean that the game is then running at lower tick and update rates. Which brings us to the next subject. While many other games like Battlefield, CSGO, Overwatch or even free to play games like Quake Champions run at a tick rate of 60 Hz and send and receive 60 updates per second or even more, Call of Duty was stuck at 20 Hz on dedicated servers and 10 Hz for client hosted matches as I could show you in my netcode analysis for Black Ops 3, Infinite Warfare and Modern Warfare Remastered. So why is that a problem? When you play a game that uses tick and update rates of 60Hz, then the server sends 60 updates per second to your PC or console. Compared to the 10Hz that Infinite Warfare uses for client hosted matches, this means that a game that is running at 60Hz offers up to 83 milliseconds less delay between you and the server. Also occasional packet loss is less of an issue then as well. Another problem that is also caused by low tick and update rates are super bullets. That is the issue where one hit deals more damage than a gun can deal with one hit. The reason behind this is that at an update rate of 10 Hz you have 100 milliseconds between two data packets. That's the same time that you have between two bullets at 600 RPM. So this means that we have one update per fired round as long as there is no packet loss. But when a gun fires more than 600 rounds per minute or when there is packet loss, then the damage of two or more shots can and will get sent to the receiving player in one update, who then receives that damage all at once in form of one massive super bullet. So when you consider the downsides of tick and update rates below 60 Hz, then you can understand why the community got very excited when one of the developers announced that Call of Duty World War 2 will run at 60 Hz. But does it? To find out, I joined the game server and then opened Wireshark to track how many packets per second are sent and received by the game client. Which was not that easy this time around as the developers decided to kill the game client as soon as you fire up Wireshark. Most likely in an attempt to make it harder to create hacks for this game. However, it's the first game where I have seen a developer block Wireshark and it's also very easy to work around this as you just need to rename the Wireshark process to something else than Wireshark. So 
When we now take a look at the input and output graphs, then we can clearly see that the server sends 60 updates per second to the client, and my client sends about 55 updates per second to the server. So Call of Duty World War II does indeed use 60 Hz now for dedicated servers, which is great. However, we must wait and see which tick and update rates are used when the game decides to use the client hosted network model, where it is then limited by the processing power of the player's PC or console as well as his internet connection. Now, before we take a look at the network delay, I want to briefly talk about the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of this game. As I said, I always got placed on a dedicated game server, which is this one here. However, the other IPs that you see here are those from other players who are on the same server. The reason why I can see them is that the game uses peer-to-peer -peer for voice over IP, which especially streamers will not be happy with as having the game reveal your WAN IP address allows others to find out more about where you live or even DDoS your internet connection. Now that the developers finally switched to 60Hz, they should also consider to move to a dedicated voice over IP server that does not reveal your WAN IP address to all the other players. Now, how do those 60Hz affect the traffic of the game? After I played Hardpoint for an hour, the game downloaded 19.95 MB of data to the server and downloaded 25.05 MB of data from the server. When I now show you the results from other games, then please be aware that this is not a rating. I just want to show you how much or little traffic is generated by today's online multiplayer games. Now, what does this upgrade to 60Hz mean for the delay that two players experience when they play on the same server at the same ping of 25 milliseconds? In my delay test, I measured an average delay of 64.5 milliseconds for damage, 67.5 milliseconds for gunfire, and movement showed an average delay of 118 milliseconds, which might explain why many players said that the game seems to have a lot of lag. When we then compare these results to those from Infinite Warfare, as well as other games that run at 60Hz, then both the damage and gunfire delays don't look too bad. However, games like CSGO, Overwatch and Quake Champions show about 20 milliseconds less delay at the same 25 milliseconds ping and 60Hz, so there is clearly room for improvement. What the beta clearly had an issue with is the delay of player movement, which I did see on servers from both Vulture and GameServers.com, where I repeated these tests multiple times. So that is something that the developers really must have a look at before the release of the game. But do these numbers also apply to the console version of the game? Well, while I sadly do not have the required hardware to run my tests on console, you will get about the same network delay on PlayStation and Xbox just that the console version is not running at more than 144 FPS and you most likely play on a 60Hz TV which increases the display lag. What you must keep in mind is that the development of games is very expensive and so as a game studio you do not only want to minimize development costs, you also want to build a system that is easy to update and maintain. This means that you will try to keep the game more or less the same on all platforms and only do platform specific changes where it's absolutely necessary. As a result, the networking and the game servers are usually exactly the same on all platforms because otherwise it would get too expensive and too complex or error prone to maintain. The only difference between platforms could be the tick rate, as we've seen in games like Overwatch and Battlefield, where just the PC version is running at 60Hz, while consoles use a lower tick rate as their hardware can't handle 60Hz in these games. But as far as I know, Call of Duty World War II uses 60Hz on console as well, so until I can test that, we have to trust the developers on this. Now, how do I know that my players have a ping of 25 milliseconds to the game server when the scoreboard only shows you that useless signal strength icon, while in example Black Ops 3 did show you the numerical ping value? Luckily, the game servers respond to ICMP, which means that I just have to run a ping from the command line to get my ping to that server. This also allowed me to find out that the indicator stays green as long as your ping is below 80 milliseconds and turns orange once your ping is higher than 80 milliseconds. It will then stay orange for a ping of up to 180 milliseconds and then turn red once your ping is higher than that. I really hope that the developers either remove these icons and show just the ping value instead, where they can also use colors to tell the player if his ping is good or bad, or add the ping value next to these useless icons if they really have to keep them. 
Speaking of icons, the developers also added warning icons that you might know from Battlefield or Overwatch. These icons will tell you when there is a network related problem which can lead to issues like rubber banding, receiving hits very far behind cover or that shots might not register at all. The developers also use colors here to indicate how severe the issue is. An occasional appearing yellow icon should mean that the issue is not that bad, while a red icon means that your experience will suffer quite a bit. That said, I think that the developers should lower the threshold for the red icons as they were triggered really late in the beta. Now, I do know that many players get annoyed by these icons. However, I'm very happy that the developers decided to add them in this game because when you get one of these icons and then die very far behind cover, then you at least know why this happened, while previously you had no idea that there was something wrong with your connection to the server. Now, what do these icons mean? This one tells you that your connection to the server is suffering from packet loss. That's when data gets lost between your client and the server. The next one will show up when you have a very high ping to the game server, which will lead to the issue where you receive damage very far behind cover. Based on my tests, this one shows up when you have a lot of latency variation, which means that your ping is changing quite a lot, like constantly going up and down between 40 and 100 milliseconds. But I honestly have no idea what the last one means. I tried to find any explanation of these icons and I also reached out to a developer, but I could not get an answer yet. If you know what this icon means, then please let me know in the comments down below. Usually, this is the point in the video where I show you the results of my lag compensation tests. Now, even though I managed to get my test players onto the same server and in different teams to do my damage delay tests, I sadly could not do a single lag compensation test as we constantly got killed by the other players. But I will try to do that once the game has been released. So, based on what I've seen in the beta, the developers did clearly try to improve the networking of this game as it now runs at 60Hz. However, they can reduce the delays even further and they should have a look at the movement delay which is unusually high and most likely responsible for the poor experience that made many players doubt that this game is even running at 60Hz. What I also want to mention is that the PC version of this game received some love from the developers, as unlike Infinite Warfare and Modern Warfare Remastered, it is not locked at 91 FPS and it even comes with a built-in FPS limiter. I also found that the performance was quite good, but that might be different on other systems. Now, if you enjoyed this netcode analysis of the Call of Duty World War II beta, then it would be great if you could support me on Patreon. Without the great support that I get from my patrons, I simply could not continue to bring you these netcode analysis videos or input delay tests like my upcoming test of the 240Hz ASUS PG258Q and Acer Predator XB272 monitors. So if you like my work, then you can find the link to my Patreon in the description down below, where you can also do a one-time donation now. Also, if you want to stay up to date on what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, the links are also in the description of this video. And if you don't want to miss the next one, then you might want to subscribe to my channel and click on the little bell icon below this video to receive a notification when I upload the next one. So if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.